Hey everyone, we're back here live in Austin, streaming out at you from the Open Source Summit. We're having a great time. This is our third day of coverage here, though technically it's only day two of the event. Mm -hmm. It's a long story, but we'll talk about it later. Let me introduce you to our next two guests, because this is a, a conversation I was really looking forward to. To my left here is a gentleman who's been on, on TechStrong TV a few times with us. We talked in person. Great person. Uh, he's the... He is a VP of research yes. for Linux Foundation, uh, Stephen Hendrick. And, and Stephen, welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. And joining Stephen and I from our friends at Sneak, Matt Javers. And Matt, if I'm not mistaken, you're head of uh, Director developer, of developer relations. Director of developer relations. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. So, uh, Stephen and Matt presented, was it yesterday? Yeah, yeah yesterday, yeah. On a new survey mm -hmm. that you guys recently uh, announced and revealed and report. Why don't you, if you don't mind, share with yeah, our audience. Sure, sure, I'd love to. So um, OpenSSF is a very big project inside the Linux Foundation. Uh, Brian As Bell we've seen. Brian <laughs> Bellendorf, yeah. Yep. And so uh, at his request, we went out and did a survey into sort of what's happening in the open source space as far as secure software development. So we put together a survey in March, we fielded it in April, we wrote it up, um, analyzed it, wrote it up in May, and had it produced in June, and so it's being released here at the event. Uh, I think that happened yesterday morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe it did. Yeah. Uh, we did it in partnership with Sneak. Um, Great. So that's why we've been working together with uh, the messaging on all this. Um, and it's, um, it, it was not a surprise from the standpoint of what the results were, but it wasn't, um, uh, I was a little disappointed in kind of where we are at this point from the standpoint of the uptake of, of you know, the attention to security when it comes to open source. So anyway, so we've got information that to talk a little bit about, you know, where we are, you know, how sort of, to, to understand the context of the problem, and then we have information about what people are doing about it. And it's, it's, that's more exciting in many respects because um, good things are happening. Oh, I, I agree. So first of all, look, I think we're always disappointed when we do these surveys and we find out, yeah. you know, beyond the lip service that gets paid to security, what actually is going on under the covers. And right. we're always wishing for, and hoping for more. Yeah. That being said, I, I, I don't want to be pessimistic. I, I am of the glass half full mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, opinion that we are doing better and more security now than we probably ever have done. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. That being said, before we dive into it, mm -hmm. I just want to really just quickly, so open SSF, is I openssf.org is I believe the website, yeah. and I'm going to assume that the report is there for anyone who wants to download it. That's right. So let, yep. Let's say let's say that up front for people at home following along. Yep. Whether it's live well, or you're watching this, it's recorded. on the Sneak site. It's so also on, on the Sneak Linux site. Foundation site, and it's on OpenSSF. Yeah, there's a whole right. thing. It's everywhere. I, it. I think we might have covered it via Sneak over on Security Boulevard. I think I did some pr I did some press interviews on Probably it uh, before flying out here. So yeah, we may have discussed. So it may it, yeah. very well be on our security boulevard site. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's out there for people. Yeah. Let's dive in now, though. What was some of the findings, Stephen? Sure. Um, well, let's see. What we'll start with is this whole issue of: Do organizations have an open source security policy? And what we found was forty nine percent said they had one. That's good. That's good. 34% did not, and 17% 17, 17 said we don't use open said, source. No, just them, no, no, everybody uses open 98% of organizations use it. So, And 17% said they don't know. So they we don't even know. They don't know if mm -hmm. they have one or not. So if you take put aside the don't knows at this point, you've got about a 60-40 split between use, uh, don't have a, have a policy, and don't have a policy. I mean, and if you look at a little more deeply into that, what you find is that small companies are more likely to not have a policy. And that's not surprising. They are resource constrained. Um, so it's harder for them to have CISOs and OSPOs and policies, be it for either just software development or open source software development. So I can understand the challenges there. 
Um, so, but the idea of when you, even if you look at company size, we still ended up with about 30% of large and yeah. very large organizations that don't have a policy for open source software development. Uh, so a couple of thoughts. First of all, I empathize with small SMB businesses. We're an SMB business. Yeah. But in today's day and age, and maybe it's when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But in today's day and age, how do you not have security policies? How do you not have security, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a, there's a couple of different things at, at play there. I mean, uh, I, you know, addressing addressing open source security, you know, is 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 more complex than, than it yes. seems because it's not just about the the code itself, you've kind of got to understand how open source is, is, uh, is created, how projects are governed, because governance can have a, a big mm -hmm. play into, you know, whether, uh, if you look at some of those recent things around the sort of protest where movement, where we've seen maintainers kind of go in rogue, you know, and this comes down right. to single maintainer governance projects. And you need to take those things like governance into account if you're going to base your business on something, right? And so, but you, but you just said... And that's a complex... A loaded, a loaded question. I would bet, if I was a betting man, right, that a lot... At the large enterprise level, you're 100% correct. At the SMB level, if you ask most of these people a threshold question of where is your open source software? You know, it's 10 o'clock, where is your open source software? Mm -hmm. A lot of them don't know because they're SaaS ops companies, mm. right? They right. don't they don't have a server closet. Their cloud installation, it, it's they're, they're running on SaaS. That's right. And so the beautiful part about SaaS is, well, one of the nice things about SaaS is you don't know what's behind the curtain. You just know you log in on the website and you, it's got all your information there that you need. Are they using an open source database? Are they using you know what's it, what what is what are they using behind the curtain a lot of smaller companies don't know and as part of their due diligence they don't dig right. that deep so i i could again i can empathize right. the larger ones the larger enterprises though that's a problem that is but i think you know you in a lot of those larger <coughs> enterprises you you've got that kind of uh uh ingrained culture over a long time in terms of, of, uh, of security and about how you consume software. And you know, the, the hardest problem in security isn't really about technology at all, right? It's always about people and culture. And I think, you know, probably in a, a lot of larger organizations, mm -hmm. you've got a, a kind of, uh, you know, that sort of friction of, well, we've always done it like that. Well, you also have a lot of change going on from the standpoint of how software is being developed. Yeah, sure. And I think that's part of the problem as well, which is that you know change it's, is change is always hard for people. Yeah. And especially with the, given the rapid evolution of tools and standards, in, in essence, around how we should do security for software. Yeah. Um, exactly. It's everything's changing so quickly. It's I think it's probably hard for people to keep up. Because we've got these two kind of things happening, almost a perfect storm at the same time. We've got this massive rise in, in supply chain attacks on open source because, you know, it's a victim of its own success, right? That's right. And attackers have realized it's a lot easier to get into the supply chain than it is to, mm -hmm. to find zero days in, in, in end user applications. So you've got that going on where all of a sudden folks are going, well, everything we do is based on open source. Like, what do I do about security? And then, as, as Steve pointed out, you've got this this uh, ongoing massive transformation of how we develop software. Right. You know, this super fast, high velocity. I blame DevOps. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> DevOps but, uh, but I mean, unless you do, unless you can transform, you know, someone's going to eat your lunch, right? Because yeah. there's, there's some hungry competitor behind you who's disruptive and who's, who does have a super fast software delivery pipeline. They can deliver new features. They know how to analyze the data. Right. Yeah. And so for, for a lot of big organizations, they've got these two big problems happening right at the same time because that change in software development requires a completely different approach to security. You know, the space that, that it's the thing that sneaks talk about all the time about developer first. Yeah. I mean, you look at, let's say, the Phoenix Project by Gene Kim, right? And, and that's based on a book called The Goal. Yeah. Right? 
And yeah, the thing about, so the goal is about manufacturing, but really the, the principle behind the goal, and I think Gene tried to capture that in the Phoenix Project, is that, look, as soon as we kind of erase one bottleneck, we see that next bottleneck yeah. right behind mm -hmm. it. And don't think that once you get rid of that bottleneck, right. it's yeah. smooth sailing. It's not. Mm -hmm. We have massively, revolutionarily speeded up the pace of software development. Mm -hmm. We did it in large part by creating this, this software factory right. with pipeline, yep. CICD, DevOps kind of things. That in, in the enabler of that was having this massive library of open source yeah, indeed. That's right. pieces yeah. that we can assemble into a very apps. high quality software that's that's So man, we blew through that roadblock at 150 mm. miles an hour. And the wall we hit right after is wait a second, now that's become a huge security mm -hmm. uh, problem. Right? So for companies that are developing their own code, this is this is a major thing. Right. Knowing that, though, and still telling me that 30% of the companies don't have a, a policy around mm -hmm. it, scary. Yeah, mm. it is. Well, let's, we, should, we should talk Go about more. what people are doing about trying, trying to deal with this issue. All right, here's the good news. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> so, so we asked a question, which was, okay, so how do you intend to improve on the situation? What are, you, what are you doing? And we had quite a long list of responses. Top of the list was, Organizations were looking for more intelligent tools from a, that were, had a security focus. So we're talking SCA, SAS, DAST, IAC, you know, all the usual suspects, and looking really to those, those tools to be able to help them improve their security posture. So that was top of the list. That was 59%. And then right behind that at 52% was a strong desire to understand and essentially codify best practices for how to do secure software development. That was really encouraging because we know all about best practices. Yep. We know exactly you know, what they all are. In fact, David Wheeler at LF. Actually, know, we had David A. Wheeler. Yeah, David A. Wheeler. Okay. Uh, we, we interviewed David <laughs> yesterday and yes. I have a follow-up. By mistake. Well. <laughs> I, I learned that. Okay, you want to see the marks? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but, okay. But, yes, David is, yeah. is working so, on that. So, you know, he and I had lunch yesterday, and we were talking about this, because I said, you know, how many best practices do you have? So, you know, counted them all up. He's got, like, 150, 160. So that's kind of daunting. And he said, like, the last 25 to get to the highest level can take, in some cases, years to master. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is, despite understanding what these best practices are, it's yeah. still very challenging to wrap your head around what is necessary to be successful there. Be, and, and partly because, you know, as we were just talking about, that, that uh, culture change is such a, a big part of how you make that transition from, you know, your kind of old school security as gatekeeper kind of function <laughs> yeah, right. to this thing where We're all you put it. it to the developers because the developers are the ones who, you know, you fix it at the developer eyeball before it's got anywhere near, yeah. you know, production. Well, That's and the it's cheapest just 10 to fix it, right? right, I was going to say 10 to 100x cheaper to do yeah. it there. And I mean, we look at the other interesting thing here that's slightly tangential to this, but it is like how many developers there are in the world, right? And how many we anticipate there being. You know, there's something like, I, I think the, the, uh, the, the um, anticipation is something like 30 million developers in the world. And there's only like a I tiny proportion of, of, of yeah. security folk. So I go by GitHub accounts. Right? Okay. There's about 70 plus million GitHub accounts right now. So let's assume it's not one to one. Right. But I think it's safe to say mm. there's 40 to 45 million developers mm -hmm. probably growing at somewhere in the area of 10% yeah. a year. I would agree. And, and security yeah. professionals aren't, uh, aren't growing at that rate. So security professionals are growing because we're starting to see. Look, when I came up, you didn't have a cybersecurity major in college. Mm, We're yeah. seeing schools churn out cybersecurity majors. Mm -hmm. Are they security professionals? I'll leave it to you. But, um, but there are people coming out here who, who want to work in security, but not anywhere near. I mean, you're, you're talking yeah. here and here. Um, here. Here's an interesting thing, though, I, and I think... It's, it's what's turning up the heat on all of this, is that this is getting major focus 
from the White House, yeah. sure. from yeah. the federal yeah. government. Yeah. The whole world is saying, hey, this is a problem. Right. This is a big problem. Well, you know, we got to do something. You know, I did a report last year, uh, a survey on S bombs. Yep. And I got to tell you, that factors right into this now. Oh, of course. Um, because, you know, we did some stats um, in this survey on dependencies, you know, both direct and transitive, and found really sort of low levels of strong, uh, strong security uh, around, you know, or organizations understanding the security posture of all these different um, you know, dependencies and dependencies of dependencies. Yeah. You know, really low numbers there. S-bombs would go so far in helping sort all that out. Yeah. Because, you know, S-bombs are going to give you knowledge about the metadata. It's going to give you usability. Um, so you, you know that you're licensed to use the stuff. Yep. And it's going to know, it's going to give you trust that not only what you're looking at for metadata is non-falsified, but also understanding quite clearly, you know, what's been fixed, what hasn't been fixed from a vulnerability standpoint. So I'll tell you over the last two days here, we, we've, well, we've done a lot of interviews, but no shortage of people talking about SBOM and SBOM solutions. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're going to see, just like everything else in technology, we're going to see sort of a Cam Cambrian explosion of SBOM <laughs> solutions out there, and then the market will figure out which ones make sense, which yeah. ones don't. Sure. Um, my fear is that we we think X S bombs are a magic bullet for yeah. software supply yeah. chain security because we have a tendency of doing that in security. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, ultimately, yeah. when we, the, 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 I, I think the real challenge here is going to be the, the chain of trust part yeah. of that, right? Yes. Because I mean, what's an S bomb at the end of the day? It's right. a text file with some yeah. with some stuff. Well, in no, it. but they're you know, they're, right. they're, they're building some elaborate mm. text yeah. files yeah. in this, yeah. in this right. thing. Yeah. It's a lot of good metadata. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, but one more point I want to touch on, though, is that um, the number three issue from the standpoint of doing improvements to your software security posture was more automation. Mm -hmm. So IAC tools ended up ranking very highly from the standpoint of helping you address that particular need. And just for our audience, IAC? Uh, infrastructure as code. Right. Okay. okay. So that, that one actually surprised me because this whole idea of you know developers manual activities not only it, that is a, is a, a, a great way to invite in problems and so more automation ultimately is is better uh, we did some some work last year as part of our cloud native application security report and what was really interesting there was um, you know, we kind of use uh, high levels of, of development automation, i.e. automated CI CD pipelines yeah. and, and all that stuff as a as a proxy for how far along your cloud native journey you are, right? I think it's a, it's a pretty reasonable proxy to take. And in organizations with those high levels of, of deployment automation, for a start, we see uh, much higher levels of adoption of security tooling because automation gives you uh, lots of places where you can hook in other automation, yeah. but um, most importantly, we see a massive reduction in the time to fix of vulnerabilities right. because yeah. through directly through <coughs> a direct correlation to. Look, I, I've been yeah. I've been in security a long time. We had a vulnerability uh, solution in a company I founded back in 2005. And back then, I, uh, there was a company called Hercules. Uh, uh, Citadel was the company. Hercules was the yeah. product, right? They were <coughs> doing. You know, they were pushing automated remediation. There's several companies today that have automated remediation. For whatever reason, up until now, organizations have been hesitant to adopt automated mm. remediation because yep. yep. they're afraid it's going to break something else if it, in a totally automated situation. Now, doing this f further left in the, in the development pipeline, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it's broken, supposedly that should come up in testing. Yeah, exactly. Would clear, exactly. Right? I mean, and we right. could fix this is it. this is again what we see when when companies adopt sneak is like you know the the automated remediation part of it in terms of automated fix PRs, you know is uh, is probably not where people start, right. but very quickly they they go. Right. Oh, I, I actually, think they've got to overcome like, their hesitancy. Yeah. And say, yeah. Look, this is a no-brainer. Yeah, right. absolutely. Because it, it, it goes back to what I said before: blame blame DevOps, right? <laughs> If, if we are going to automate the CICD pipeline, we're going to automate building software, mm -hmm. 
the answer cannot be that we're going to manually do security. That's right, correct. Yeah. That's right. It just it doesn't work. It's a disconnect. Yeah, I mean, and it's an anti-pattern in terms of, yeah. of velocity, right? I mean, velocity is the, the key differentiator for whether um, sort of uh, businesses in the cloud era are going to survive. Absolutely. You know, because, and, and if you don't have velocity, you're, you're but No, but a lesson we've probably learned done. in security, and we should have learned over the last 25 years, is if we are going to drag our heels and dig our heels in and say, no, 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 no. You know what? The train leaves the station without you. Yeah. So either get on board and figure out, yes, we can, and here's how, or get out of the way, right? Lead, follow, get out of the way. Security cannot be the drag right. on this because velocity is too well, uh, and, and what where we see uh, folks who've successfully made this transition to to develop a first, you see this sort of uh, this change in in security teams from kind of being gatekeepers to being enablers, uh, enablers of the pavement. I agree. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, I sort agree. Of toolsmiths. That's DevSecOps right there. You, yeah. you just the the just the 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 heart of it. That's yeah. it. Stephen, anything else? So um, so, what's the answer to? this issue of uh, not having a security policy. I mean, is it, uh, do you need to start with a CISO? Do you need to start with an OSPO? Do you need, or, or at least part-time roles in people and organizations, you know, in those functions, if you were small? I mean, is that a, I mean, I think I'm not it, sure what the answer is, but I mean, it, it, we need one. I think when people th think about policies, they think, oh, this needs to be like a hundred page document of some kind, you know, this is, a, it, and it becomes overwhelming, but really a policy can be a one-liner, right? Amen, right. And, amen. And, and I mean, we, 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 we have this conversation a lot when people start to adopt security scanning, right? They've done no security scanning before, and they scan this software and they go, oh my God, I've got like 500 vulnerabilities, what do I do? But you've got to just pick a, pick a starting point, right? And I mean, usually, you know, a sensible place would be no critical vulnerabilities that have got a fix in production. Well, there's right. a policy right there, yeah. right? Yep. And it's three lines. I, I, and it's better than it, having he's zero. He's 100% right, Stephen. Right. I've run into this firsthand. People, they hear, oh, we need a security policy. They think I need the employee handbook, yeah. right, that comes from your EEO that's <laughs> yeah. this thick. Yeah. You know, it could be one page right. of five bullet points. Mm -hmm. Anything that's critical is, is worthy to stop production. Anything not critical does not, doesn't stop production, but it has right. to get fixed within 30 days. That's a policy. Right. And, and I mean, and there's plenty of, of great templated stuff there out certainly there in terms are. of... Uh, of usage of open source, you know, the stuff. And by the way, I'd love to see the, open, the OSSF have a library of yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. So and you never really need to start <laughs> a blank sheet of paper. <laughs> right. And actually, the good news is once you have policy, then automation can follow yeah. pretty quickly. So yeah. that, that's, that's the right path. You're right. Guys, we've got our next guest here in the okay. wings. We could talk about this all day. I'm sure <laughs> I'd love to, but <laughs> it wouldn't be fair to them. Yeah. Um, Again, we can, you can get this survey over on the Sneak site, which is snyk.com. Dot .io. Dot .io, excuse me. Or on the uh, OpenSSF, I think it's OpenSSF.org is. Right. is the right. website there. Stephen, good work again. Hey. I love your surveys, hey, man. Very good. Thank Pleasure you. Thanks so much, Alan. Pleasure.